depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Munis Farooqi, and I am the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley. I also am a faculty member in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. It is a great honor to welcome you to the SS Pizada Dissertation Prize Ceremony for the year 2021. The Pizada Dissertation Prize is an annual award that honors the best doctoral work relevant to the study of Pakistan in the humanities, social sciences, education, or law. It is open to anyone who has completed a dissertation in the previous year in North America or Europe. For those of you who are unaware of the Pizada Prize's history, it was endowed by Mr. Rafat Pizada and his wife, Ms. Amna Jafar, in the name of Rafat's father, Sayyid Sharifuddin Pizada. Sharifuddin Pizada was born in Burhanpur, India in 1923, and after receiving his legal training at Bombay University and the Lincolns in the United Kingdom, he served as a personal secretary to Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan in the late 1940s. Over the course of a decades long career, Sharifuddin Pizada emerged as one of the leading constitutional scholars of Pakistan. He continued his legal work right until his last week of life in 2017, aged 94. Sharifuddin Pizada has held or held many important appointments over the course of his long career. Among others, and I emphasize among others, he served as foreign minister of Pakistan, had three stints as attorney general of Pakistan, was the secretary general of the Organization of Islamic Conference and chairman of the United Nations Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Throughout his long and yes, no doubt, sometimes controversial career, Sharifuddin Pizada's friends and detractors disagreed over many things. But everyone conceded that Sharifuddin Pizada's life was marked by a love of intellectual pursuits, a deep intellectual generosity to those around him, an understanding of the importance of education and a commitment to public service. It is these same values that led his son, Rafat Pizada, to endow this first of a kind dissertation prize devoted to Pakistan studies. And since its inception, the prize has gone to scholars like Ambar Abbas, who focused on the experiences of the partition generation of Aligarh Muslim University, Simon Fuchs, who explored the linkages between the Shia ulama in South Asia and their counterparts in Iran and the Middle East, William Sherman for his study of the messianic 16th century religious movement called the Roshaniya, Salman Hussain for his examination of the lawyers movement of 2007-9, Myra Hayat for her inquiry into the intersecting ecologies of water and governance, and this year's awardee, Essan Kamal. His work, of course, is focused on individuals and communities on the front lines of defending the river Indus from damming and environmental destruction. For more information about past prize recipients, please go to the list of awardees on the Institute for South Asia Studies' Pizada Prize webpage. As you might imagine, choosing a prize recipient and then setting up a ceremony to honor them requires the efforts of many people. And so allow me to begin by thanking the 2021 Prize Selection Committee comprising Professor Iftikhar Dadi of Cornell University, Professor David Gilmartin of North Carolina State University, Professor Homera Ibtadar of King's College London, and Professor Sadia Saeed of the University of San Francisco. I'm deeply grateful to them for their willingness to serve on this committee, their hard work, and their collegiality. In a normal year, this ceremony would have taken place at the Institute for South Asia Studies' uh, venue in Stevens Hall on Berkeley's campus. This year's recipient, Essen Kamal, would be with us in person, and there may be you know, anywhere between 60 and 70 audience members. And in all likelihood, given that we always hold the ceremony in April when the weather is beginning to warm up in Berkeley, the doors and windows would have been open, allowing us to feel the first hints of warm air and hear the bubbling sounds of Strawberry Creek running alongside our building. This year is, well, a little different. As with the previous 2020 prize ceremony, we are on Zoom. No doubt some of the immediacy and intimacy of being on campus is gone, the socializing and making of acquaintances as well. Furthermore, there's a new challenge of making sure that the ceremony is not disrupted by any unexpected power shortages or tech glitches, including bad lighting, blurry images, poor audio quality and so on. Remarkably, however, we have gained some things. You, for example, our global audience, 
as well as the ability to sit in the comfort of our homes or offices or wherever you might be and still engage in conversations happening thousands of miles away. Much of this from Berkeley's end at least is only possible because of my amazing colleagues in the Institute for South Asia Studies. And I particularly want to give a shout out to Punita Kala, who's our tech maestro and the person who keeps the trains running on time in Zoom world. Although it is not my honor to introduce Professor S. N. Kamal, the 2021 prize recipient, it is my brief to introduce my colleague, Professor Isha Ray, who will introduce him and then after his talk, offer some discussions comments. Professor Ray is a faculty member of both the Energy and Resources Group and the Department of Geography. She also is the co-director of the Berkeley, <clears throat> excuse me, Water Center and a faculty member of the Institute for South Asia Studies. With a BA from Oxford University and a PhD from Stanford University, Professor Ray's research interests lie in the areas of water, sanitation development, water and gender, technology and development, and common property resources. In addition to a co-edited 2008 volume with Professor Pranav Bardhan called Contested Commons, Conversations Between Economists and Anthropologists, Professor Ray is the author or co-author of more than 30 articles that focus on water and development, around 10 that are focused on sanitation and development, 15 or more on technology and society, and at least eight on natural resources and development. And such prolific scholarship does not even get into a myriad numbers of reports, opinion pieces, and other written and co-written pieces by her. Nor does it capture her popularity as an invited speaker, panelist, conference participant, or trainer of the next generation of graduate students. And now, Without further ado, it gives me the greatest pleasure to welcome Professor Isha Ray to the Zoom stage. Thank you so much, Munis, for that truly generous and warm introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. And the first thing I would like to do is to welcome all of you to this virtual Berkeley campus. Uh, virtual is all we have right now, as Munis rightly said. But nevertheless, it is a warm Berkeley welcome that I extend on behalf of all of us at the Institute for South Asian Studies to all of you around the world. Second, it is truly my pleasure to introduce and bring before you Dr. Ehsan Kamal, the writer of Saving Sindhu, lecturer at the National Institute of Pakistan Studies in Islamabad, who has written the prize winning dissertation that we are going to discuss today. The warmest and most sincere congratulations to you, Dr. Kamal. This is a truly amazing work. I had the pleasure of reading it because I'm going to be the discussant. And it's a wonderful experience to read a book on the Indus when almost everything else you read about the Indus is about the conflict between India and Pakistan around the Indus Valley Treaty, where both countries, India and Pakistan, are homogenized to the ultimate degree using terms such as India wants or Pakistan said, as if these are not internally highly differentiated and dynamic countries. It is to this high differentiation and dynamism that Professor Hassan Kamal's work has taken us. He speaks about the Indus River, the Sindhu, as the communities he studies calls it, and discusses the differentiation within along this great river, along this historic river of three different communities who are fighting three different battles to save not only the river, but also themselves as communities. So I think that we're in for a really remarkable talk. I'm very much looking forward to your remarks, Dr. Kamal, and I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion afterwards. It is now my honor to welcome Dr. Ehsan Kamal to the virtual podium. Uh, thank you, Isha, for this uh, very generous and kind introduction. Um, thanks are also in order for uh, the Berkeley Institute of South Asian Studies, uh, the prize committee with uh, Homer Akhtadar, David Gilmartin, Iftakhar Dari, and Sadia Saeed, and uh, also particularly for uh, the Pirsa the family for supporting scholarship on Pakistan. And uh, I would also, um, uh, this is a, a great opportunity for me to talk not only about my dissertation, 
but also about some of the remarkable activists from Pakistan. Uh, people like Muhammad Ali Shah, Noor Muhammad Tamur of the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, uh, Khadim Hussain Fazlir Ablun, Mustaq Gadi of the Sindhu Vichawatarla, Ejaz Khan Naeem of Sanat, and so many more. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to serve as a conduit to tell the story of the river as well as to tell their story. And so in, in a way, this, uh, this recognition is as much as for my work as it is for theirs. So my plan today is to talk a little bit about uh, the significance of studying rivers uh, through three stories, uh, stories about seeing rivers, speaking rivers, and becoming rivers. And I'll then end uh, this uh, talk with three provocations. And uh, so my dissertation uh, deals with a larger question of why do some movements, some communities, some organizations defend rivers while others do not. And uh, I'm particularly focused on riverine movements by which I mean social movement organizations that mobilize to alter or maintain some aspects of human river relations. Uh, I study three movements uh, in Pakistan and the, excuse me, in the Indus Valley, these are Samat, uh, uh, Samaji Tanzim Barai Mutasirine Karbela Dam, uh, Sindhu Bachao Tarla, uh, a plea to save uh, the Indus River, and the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, uh, respectively, in representing the northern, central, and southern Indus Valley riverine communities. And all three of these movements emerged at the turn of the 21st century in response to large river infrastructure development. In the context of modern control over rivers through the construction of mega dams, irrigation systems, and drainage canal. And this period, the turn of the 21st century, was a vibrant period of uh, river activism. We know of large scale movements across the global south. And uh, the Pakistani and Indus River movements also uh, received ideas and, in some cases, strategic resources from these other places. They forged river-wide alliances and fought against the same powerful actors in Pakistan, but their goals in some organizational format differed a lot. Uh, while Samad focused on resettlement and restitution of the dam-affected people in Pakistan, Sindhu Vichawatarla and Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum turned to the broader agenda of defense of the river itself. So the, so the key question for my dissertation is, why do ideas of river defense take hold in some places along the same river and not others? So uh, the project that I uh, outlined is a broad, bigger project, but today I just hope to leave you with some provocations around the question of why rivers. Not only the question of why do some defend rivers, but why should we think about rivers? And for me, this project is a politically motivated intellectual curiosity. It, it emerges from my engagement, uh, both at, as a teaching in a public university in Islava, uh, and uh, before I was, uh, I arrived in the US for my dissertation, and also working in various activist formations and thinking about the categories of political analysis that resonate with both academics and activists, uh, categories like water, land, labor, and the environment. And as I sort of thought more and more about this, I kind of like, uh, realize that centering not just water, but river in that analysis, particularly in the context of Pakistan, was extremely important in part to recognize the work that these amazing riverine movements are doing, but also just because of the historical significance of this question. So I hope that you will take away something from this lecture uh, and find some new ways to look at the question of why rivers, and I will do so uh, through three partial stories from my field sites. Uh, the first one, river is a land problem, is how uh, the state sees rivers. And for the modern state, the river is a means to enclose land, as I will demonstrate. The second story comes from central Pakistan, uh, in, from the Siraiki Wasif, uh, Satur Sindhu, where I uh, wrestle with the question of speaking the river. Uh, on the decolonial practice of Sindhu Vichawatarla as a movement for the defense of rivers in the Saraiki majority areas of central Indus Valley. Excuse me. And the third uh, focuses on uh, Darya or Dharti, uh, sorry, Darya or Delta, the river and the Delta, and a question of how to embody the river. So these are 
This is an account of the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, which builds power for the marginalized fishers of the Indus Delta and moves from the rights of the fisher to the rights of the river. And I, uh, these are partial stories extracted from the larger dissertation. So I hope that they still resonate and kind of make sense and give you a broader uh, understanding of uh, this idea of river defense. So we begin as we must with a lament for the dead river. I'll read the Saraiki verses and hope you can follow with the English translation. Nadi mardi hai ta sun mitra ki mardiyan han dil mardi hai. Su mardi hai vasu apni di nile paniyan di ghil mardi hai. Jona hansa da kala nahi marda pure darya di khil mardi hai. Kina moya de itbar karu itbar karu moye darya da. These verses are from Saraiki poet Ashu Lal's Katha Ravi which mourns the death of one of the great rivers of the Indus Valley, River Ravi, uh, an eastern tributary of the Indus River, also known with other names, Iravati, one of the five rivers of Punjab, Purushni, one of the seven rivers of the Saptava Sindhu, uh, the seven rivers of the land of Sindhu mentioned in the Rig Vedas. And Ashu mourns the river lost to colonial and state-driven desires to enlist ancient rivers into modern cycles of production and consumption. He laments the death of the smiles and slumbers of the blue waters, the death of our own eyes and hearts, not a loss of a pair of swan, but the loss of the laughter of the entire river. When the river dies, my dearest, listen. So let's move to the first story. Now, in Asha's lament for Ravi, the river lost the river is lost due to the arrival of modern irrigation system and the distribution of water between irrigators and the nation state. This river death can be traced back to the 19th century when European colonizers turned fertile river valleys of Asia, Africa, and Americas into experiment grounds of modern civil engineering. They conquered lands and sought to control rivers, justifying this conquest of, by, by, through bi biblical notions of turning deserts into gardens of Edens. But uh, their actual motivations, as we well know, was plunder and profit. And uh, in order to sort of plunder the land of the Indus Valley, uh, primarily by transforming it into private property, by making it quote unquote productive, uh, in, in order to enclose the river, they had to enclose, sorry, in order to enclose the lands, they had to enclose the river. And I will talk a little bit about the differences in this enclosure. Uh, in, in my uh, sort of final remarks. But by the 20th century, we know that the Bretton Woods Institute, particularly the World Bank, took over this task of enclosing rivers and started to build mega dams to extend already massive irrigation systems in the Indus Valley, particularly in ex-colonies all across the world. In just over a century, the number of large dams rose from 500 to 50,000, covering about 90% of the major river basins across the world. And today, hydropower dams are the most massive structures humans have ever built on this planet, dwarfing other constructions by a wide margin. And these river enclosures come at a great cost to human and non-human communities. And, and this is like well demonstrated in uh, all sorts of academic literature. And so, you know, nothing sort of new in that sense there. Um, So the, uh, the, the construction of one of the biggest dam, the first mega dam on uh, the Indus River, Tarvela Dam, it has been a focus of a part of my dissertation. And the Indus Valley was the center of this massive world historical transformation. It boasted of the largest contiguous irrigation system in the world. Uh, but, but while the British had total control over the Indus waters and Indus lands, the Indus Basin was, as you know, split between India and Pakistan at the time of partition, which led to a great conflict. And this is a story well known and often told. Uh, it is a period after a period of negotiation helmed by the World Bank. Pakistan and India signed the Indus Border Treaty. India got control over the eastern rivers of the Punjab, including River Ravi, further expanding the infrastructure empire, causing to the death of River Ravi as it stopped flowing in Pakistan. And for, for its part, Pakistan was to make up for this loss of uh, uh, this, uh, this valuable water as a commodity by damming the, the Western rivers, by building Mangla Dam on Jhelum and Tarvela Dam on the Indus River. 
And so these form the Indus Basin projects along with uh, an array of river link canals and irrigation system. Now, the Vela was marred with technical difficulties and financial challenges, which I sort of outlined, but when it was complete, completed through the 1970s and the 80s, the Pakistani state saw this as a crown jewel of the nation's agricultural economy. And the World Bank for its part that funded the project boasted of its ability to fund these ambitious projects. Uh, the uh, World Bank president on a visit to Nepal uh, claimed that, look, these projects are very difficult to fund, but we've done Tarbela, so we could do any other project. And Tarbela was the largest single a civil, uh, civil construction contract in, in the world at that time. And the Pakistani engineers were ecstatic by overcoming these uh, technical difficulties and taming the giant river. But like other mega dams, Tarvela also came with great cost. Dammed and fragmented rivers fare very badly on biodiversity index. They lead to displacement. Uh, they also can lead to widespread floods and massive, massive ecological destruction in the downstream areas. They prevent water, water and sediments from nurturing wetlands and delta ecosystems. And the restricted flows in the delta can cause coastal erosion and deforestation. And, and Tarbela's impact was uh, not very different. So now what I wanna propose is that by thinking about the river as uh, the enclosure framework, we can see that the Tarbela Dam was not a project in isolation, it was integrated and it had river-wide effects. So basically the dam built in Tarbela was built to stock flows, then divert these flows through various irrigation uh, schemes particularly in Southern Punjab and uh, uh, in Sindh, as well as diverting the flows eastward uh, to the old canal colonies that would have been uh, irrigated by rivers like Krabi. But the, the effect was also felt in the Delta where the scarcity of water started showing the face of uh, a dead river. And this is where um, I just wanna quickly show you the sort of satellite imagery. This is 1984, the earliest imageries we have and you can sort of see the visibly, uh, the coastline sort of declining, especially visible in the top and the lower corner uh, of this, these images. So the delta, Indus Delta, was one of the largest delta in the arid regions of the world. And it is basically uh, a large area where the river silt would produce about 80 square kilometer of new land every year and it was a rich and biodiverse region. And with the construction of the large scale dams and irrigation schemes, it slowly started dwindling. And currently it's about 8% of its historic time, uh, uh, historic size. And only two out of the 17 creeks see some water during the monsoon months. About 200 square kilometer of uh, land is lost each year to coastal erosion. So if you add up the land loss and the land that's not produced, this is really about the size of losing a, a, a city like New Delhi or London in, in five years or like Chicago or Manila every two years. So the, the, uh, the, the point here is that basically the enclosure of Indus was a grand scheme of transforming the land use patterns in uh, the entirety of the river basin. But while the state did plan and imagine these projects in an integrated fashion as river enclosures are done, it completely sort of uh, shied away from its responsibility to dealing with the overflows of this enclosure, both the social and the ecological overflows. And you can sort of see um, that the Tarvela Dam and its associated projects can be seen as leading to three types of land dispossession. The upstream folks, the communities under the reservoir were drowned, about 96,000 people in 1974 were uh, displaced. And a vast majority of them landless were hardly given any sort of proper compensation or settlement. Uh, then the, these kind of, uh, the, the irrigation technology that was introduced then uh, in, in the central Indus Valley or Southern Indus Valley created its own set of problem, which I demonstrate, I'll talk about briefly in the later section, but basically problems like water logging and salinity, recurring floods and, and you know all that comes with the transformation of land from uh, a subsistence or a kind of like a multi-purpose, uh, multi-cropping land with livestock grazing to this monocropping, geomo-focused uh, cropping cycles, which we kind of like know about 
uh, uh, the, the ecological and social harm of these places. And of course, the Delta itself was facing this toxic, uh, the, the toxic flows of the agricultural waste, as well as the declining flows in the Indus River. So these variety of problems, when we see the state response to the Vela Dam, it only focused on the upstream areas and try to resettle them into the new canal colonies, new barrage colonies in the southern parts, which lead to another set of land conflicts. And I go into a lot of detail about this in my dissertation, but I just want to sort of emphasize this idea that river for the state is primarily a land redistribution project, as well as just a water distribution project. Now, let me move to my second story. When the river dies, my dearest, listen. Ashulal's poem don't merely live on the pages, but are sung and heard all over the Saraiki Vasev. Now, Saraiki Vasev is a large region in the central Indus Valley with various irrigation projects. And it is, uh, it is an area with an ongoing Saraiki cultural and political movement for the creation of a separate province in, in, in a form of regional autonomy. It is also a place where a remarkable river defense movement emerged in the early 2000s, the Sindhu Vijayatanda, a plea to save the Sindhu River. So I want to talk particularly about Sindhu Vichartala and uh, social movement infrastructure, uh, the Lok Sat, and um, the uh, a, a, an infrastructure that is an exercise and uh, an experiment, and as the activists call a meditation in truth. It's about speaking and the listening practices of the Saraiki people, the indigenous fishers, uh, to generate new visions of rivers and river defense. Now, Sindhu Vijayatala was founded in 2005 uh, when the fishers on one of the dams, uh, a small run of the river dam, also known as the Biraj, uh, Tonsa Biraj, they faced eviction when the World Bank funded a almost $20 billion project to repair old Biraj and extend them. And the fishers and the riverine communities on either side faced imminent eviction, they organized, they protested, but not much happened. Uh, in terms of them able to resist. And it's, it's that time when uh, some activists from the Damani regions, so if this is the region to the uh, uh, west of Indus, um, the, if you see this kind of like uh, circle in the center of this map, basically the western part of the Indus, uh, and this is the region where another modern irrigation project, the Chashma Right Bank Canal was built and it wreaked havoc by destroying traditional hill, tor hill torrent systems known as Rod Kohi, which is the Pakistan's second largest irrigation system. And the canal caused new, numerous problems like water scarcity, uh, recurring floods, and loss of productive land, water logging, salinity, destruction of traditional solidarities, and increase in water conflict. And in and, 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 and the words of uh, one of the activists, Mushtaq, uh, this, this is the nature of the conflict that emerges there. So now the Damani activists had organized and protested and petitioned as uh, even invoke the uh, Asian Development Bank that was the funder, new accountability mechanism, but with limited su success. So this decided to step back from the state arena and to revive traditional form of de deliberation and decision making in the form of Lok Sat. And it's uh, loosely translated into People's Tribunal and it has some genealogical strand to the global uh, uh, sort of global movement to institutionalizing people's tribunal uh, on war crimes and then also on uh, the ecological harm of the development uh, development uh, projects. And, and so I want to show you one of the activists, Fazil, uh, and how he speaks about this. अपने मकामी कानूने दो अपने इख्तियारात दो बेले के भी ए तना सारी गाल सुन दें ना समझे दें और ना ही नेको कोई पता है सारे मसले ना चश्मा दो ते लू सत्तू थे जैसे नतीजे लोगे ए फैसला की थे के असा जब पानी भी साकु नहीं देने पाए तो असा आप यहाँ ना केरी शायद जो मैं so this is just like a brief glimpse of uh, what uh, Fazal 
and other activists do in a Sat. And I want to just spend the rest of this uh, story talking a little bit about uh, some key elements of the institution of Sat. Um, so basically, we can see Sat has a decolonizing praxis, a social movement infrastructure that is geared towards listening, deliberating, reclaiming self-sovereignty of the people in a creative and performative way. So the Lok Sat is an exercise in speech, first and foremost. It is an effort by those who, are go, who go unheard in courts and formal registers to reclaim the power to speak and listen in the idioms and languages of their choice. And uh, so Fazul says, So some of you will be familiar with that Mohavara of uh, the lice sort of crawling on the ear. So they don't even understand us. They don't even listen to us, even a slight list this, sorry, even the tiniest bit. And the state neither listens to us, nor can they comprehend our problems and challenges. And in Sat, we can speak freely and speak. And through this free speech, we can speak about the river as river, not just land. And the Sat, as I mentioned, also draws from traditional forms of decision-making where people sit in a circle to deliberate on the challenges they face. They claim the power to decide, to make law, rather than to yield to colonial era's laws of law and land acquisition and canal irrigation. And uh, the Sat also then allows people to take back the power to act, to devise social movement strategies, to form alliances, to decide whatever form of action they need to take. As further himself says that we are not going to pay the water tax because we're not getting any water. So uh, the Sat allows people then to reclaim their sovereignty that was wrestled away from them uh, by the colonial and yes, the post-colonial state often helmed by military dictators. So as a social movement infrastructure, the Sat allows a praxis of those rendered subaltern by the state to ex exercise their agency, where those that go unheard by the state uh, and the investors can speak to each other in their own idioms, where they can sing Ashu's poetry and more, mourn the death of the river, where they can remember what life was before the enclosure of the river in order to find a path to a liberated future for themselves and the river. So the Sat and the Sindhu Vichautarla achieve something beyond the strategic calculations of actors that are usually thought of as goal directed. It brings together diverse views, infusing local riverine activism with Saraiki cultural expressions of river reverence. It also centers the figure of the fisher and Adivasi people in the Saraiki demand for regional autonomy. And finally, the Sat is both a deliberative and a creative space. It's full of dances and songs and storytelling. And the performativity is grounded in local traditions, which contradicts and confronts the performati performativity of state power. Uh, state authority is usually dressed up in bureaucratic procedures, technical discourses, and sometimes with a tinge of despotic benevolence towards the subjects. This state performance maintains the facade of authority and legitimacy in the face of state's failure to see the river and to listen to the fishers. And in the set, in, in the set whenever state officials, corporate representatives, and bankers are invited, this facade just simply dissolves. They're brought out of their elements, there are no air conditioned offices, comfortable chairs, meeting rooms, arrays of subordinates, instruments of violence. In the South, we see bureaucrats, engineers, consultants shifting about uncomfortably as they are asked to sit on the ground with ordinary people, where they're put on the spot, where their expert reasoning is confronted with expert knowledge of the people, as well as deep understanding of the uh, ecological, social impact of these different projects. So, where they are mocked for trying to appear authoritative or benevolent. So, Sat or Sindhu, Sindhu Vichayutala, becomes a space of conversions of the different streams, the Nadi and Ali of decolonial praxis, and a state of emergence of the river defense movement. It gives voice to those who are off the river, and in turn, they speak for the river. Sindhu is our home and our destination. When the river is alive, we come back to life. Says Khadim Hussain of Vasti Allah Wali Nir Gonsa. Sindhu is ours, and we find our wealth in the river, and Allah is our haken. Sir Noura Mai and her husband of Basti Shekha near Gonsa. Sindhu is the king, it is Paj Khizr, and we are of this river, said Fazle Raplun of the most developed village in Pakistan, most developed in the sense of a village where three large scale canals go, but the people don't have any water. So let me move to the final story of the day. When the river dies, my dearest listen, it's not just the pair of swan that dies, but the smile of the entire river dies. 
The delta used to be a place where the river smiled and stretched out to form a paradise before reaching the Arabian Sea. Now the signs of death of the river are most visible in the delta. The river does not flow a hundred mile stretch below Kotri Barrage, the final dam where all the leftover Indus water is diverted to irrigation fields and the large metropolitan city of Karachi. You can see this protest actually on the side and Kotri Barrage. In a small coastal village on the outskirts of Karachi, that Pakistan's largest defense movement emerged at the turn of the century. The Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum was founded in 1998 uh, to organize the coastal and inland fishers of Sindh province and then expanded to other parts of the excuse me, country and currently boasts of a membership of about 70,000 fishers. The large member base is organized in local units, uh, district bodies, and a central committee headed by uh, uh, Muhammad Ali Shah, its chairperson. And under Shah Saab's leadership, PFF has built a strong and powerful organization that fights for the rights of the fishers and the rights of the river. And in my view, PFF is one of the most remarkable social movement organization, not only just in Pakistan, but I believe in the global south. And it's impossible to do justice to its wide ranging activism. So I'll just here uh, comment on the three steps to PFF's river defense. Uh, build power, uh, transform delta, into a political territory and embody the river. So building power again is something that I can't get into in much detail, but just a list of campaigns and the success that PFF had uh, around powerful actors in Pakistan is astounding. They fought against the military, the rangers, and won contract, uh, they've won legal battles, and it's all based on grounded organization with a large scale uh, organizing base. You can see this a protest in Badin in, I believe, early 2000s against illegal occupation of the wetlands by rangers. And uh, fascinating stories all around. But I'm going to just move to, so, so uh, what PFF does is it builds power and a sense of pride and ownership among the fishers. And it, it's visible when you visit PFF's various areas, uh, and uh, basically fishers that used to sit on the ground in front of a vadero or a feudal landlord are now asked to stay out of local land conflicts uh, because PFF has built such, such uh, amazing power. And if you, if you know something about the remote areas and sin, the rural sin and the power dynamics, this is just like a mind blowing uh, and remarkable achievement. Now, the other thing that PFF does is transforms the hydrological uh, a scientifically defined territory, the delta, into a politically contested terrain. So uh, what it does is, PFF operates in the context of long-standing civil grievance over the distribution of Indus waters. The, the various dams and canals upstream uh, have seen to be uh, a capture of the Indus waters for the upper riparian uh, users and leaving Sindh with no water. And so there's a long history of associating the, the, the Indus River Sindh Darya with with the Sindh Dharti or Sindhu Desh. And but, uh, but the chairman of uh, Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, PFF, uh, argues that uh, PFF is different from this anti dam claims of other Sindhi groups because Sindhi progressive groups, as per Shasa, may be against one dam project or the other, but they're not against the overall impact of the dam. And in my sort of classification, not against the enclosure of the river. So what PFF has done is through its strong presence in the coastal delta community, it has launched a strategically designed campaign starting with seminars where to talk about the delta and to bring the fishers to self-represent, to talk about the delta in their own idioms and words, pretty much like the Sat, but in different form, in a format, and to sort of challenge the experts by bringing those experts into the delta to, so for them to witness the destruction and the violence that's happening there. So it's not just by uh, talking about in, in uh, other sort of academic discourses or civil society seminars, throwing numbers at, pe at people that really don't uh, often fail to have a, a, an impact on us. So Delta then in the Sindhi political context becomes a politically con uh, contested territory. And then a remarkable shift happens in 2009, as you can see that PFF started launching yearly campaigns for the Indus River using long marches, from the Delta to Kotri Baraj in Hyderabad to Karachi, the provincial capital, to Islamabad, uh, following the path uh, and the journey of the river itself. So I want to just quickly show what this Darya Yatra looks like. And here's 
मोहम्मद अली शाह ही लॉन्ग मार्च ही लॉन्ग मार्च भी सिंधु दरिया से जेकी भी टेम ठे आए उन टेम के खिलाफ आए सिंधु दरिया से टेम ठाए सिंधु दरिया के सुखाए भी आए सिंध धरती के तबाह गयो भी आए असि समझो था कि सिंधु दरिया सिंध धरती के जन्म दींदड़ आए बाबा तू शायद ने कोई इल्म आदा सी साहिब आ जा जेका असे पेच सुतो है छते जा रे माचे so you could see a number of things happening in that sort of video of shah saab uh, in his speech linking the darya with the dharti the defiance of the women of pff uh, led in this picture by the marhum uh, uh, tahira sayed and uh, uh, basically one of the martyrs of the indus river tragically died a few years ago and then you see another thing which is a uh, march from the final destination of the indus river to the point at kotri barrage where the river then no longer flows and you could probably see the dry bed of the river uh, here as well downstream from this barrage and so what i kind of like proposing this image is is to sort of see this blue and blue flags of fisher folk forum and these humans covering this journey of about 200 kilometers of a part where the river no longer flows as a symbolic and performative uh, sort of a, a, a walk of the river itself and um, um so sorry uh, as as a, of the river itself and and uh, shah saab has a very interesting way of talking about this and I, but before that if i don't know if you guys can read sandhi but uh, basically the the banner at the front says pyadal long march and in sandhi script it's written sindhu darya and indus delta so you can see that sindhu darya is the ancient name of the river and indus delta is an obviously modern terminology that is through scientific understanding of environmental impact and so this kind of like symbolically represents how pff takes these modern and new environmental concepts and transforms and merges them fuses them with uh, these existing historical categories of political contestation and i kind of like describe this is not just a banner it's like uh, this happens in their discourse and the embodied performances and so on and so forth and uh, shasha has a really interesting way of talking about this uh, uh, sea intrusion so you know the as i showed you the pictures of this coastal erosion there's also sea that is coming creeping inland it's creeping inland both underground as well as through the dried up river bed and uh, it has crept up to 100 kilometers in land and so shah saab says that samund darya ka mehboob hai jab darya apni aakhri manzil tak nahi pahunchta to samund uski talash mein zameen par aa jata hai so the ocean is the river's beloved and when the river no longer reaches the final destination then the uh, beloved the ocean creeps in land in search of the river so i'm going to try to conclude pretty quickly i'm actually um, uh, lost track of time but uh, what i've kind of like suggested today is uh, 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 i've kind of like asked you to think about rivers slightly differently to, to through three stories of seeing speaking and embodying the river so i i hope that i've given you some lens of river thinking the first story poses this idea of the view of the modern state and investors and their landlocked desires to profit by enclosing river enclosures 
Now, land here is in the modern ideal type of privately held exclusive land that generates revenue for the state and the investor. So it's kind of like enclosed land. But so the state in a way is enclosing the river to enclose the land. And the second story poses the question of then how do you speak about this river? The, the state's own view of land contradicts the other ways of being and seeing the river as uh, demonstrated by uh, the, 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 the way Fuzzle is talking about it and what I've kind of told. And in the second story, I've emphasized the uh, silencing and the attempts of subaltern speech by those who are witnessing the death of the Indus Valley rivers. And the final story poses a question of embodying the river, of officials of the Delta build power and fight for the river, uh, fight for their own rights, because uh, fighting for the rights of the fisher is not separate from the fighting for the rights of the river itself. So I'm going to leave with three provocations. First, the river enclosures. Uh, I've invited you to, through river thinking, I've talked about river enclosures. River enclosures are integrated based on various interconnected projects. Uh, they have project proximate and system-wide effects that are spread over time and space over a century of half infrastructure development in the Indus Valley, for instance. They require a strong state, colonial and post-colonial, and in case of Pakistan, dominated by authoritarian and military dictators. And I go into a fair bit of detail talking about how every time a military dictator comes, these projects are just streamlined. And every time a politically representative government comes, there's always this kind of like negotiation that happens. There's space for politics beyond uh, this kind of like enclosure of the river politics. And at this fails, uh, the state also fails to deal with the social and ecological overflows of the Indus River and its performance of authority and legitimacy is threatened by these failures. And it is in these material and political and cultural aspects that I propose a basic sketch of a theory of river enclosures and identify this as a cause of river death. My second provocation is about river defense, uh, how locally organized social movements, spontaneous with project specific concerns can expand to become wider movements of river defense. And here I suggest that it, the alliance over rivers is not enough. You have to think about seeing and speaking and embodying the river in ways that are completely discouraged or uh, uh, not allowed on the formal political arena of contestation. And I'll just uh, uh, conclude this by talking about my own performance, the performance of research as I've Mentioned that this project is uh, for me not just was wasn't just a dissertation project but uh, sort of a action research oriented projects. Uh, it was intended to work with these remarkable activists to tell their stories. And uh, I, I, while I was based in the institution of Global North, and while we we're gathered here together to celebrate scholarships presented in the Global North, this is also a project that is not of the Global North. It's about a project from the South. Uh, it's a project from uh, crossing the borders between the global north and the global south, between the academic and activist spaces, between theory and praxis. So it's fitting to also recognize these things. And I've been really keen on uh, talking about uh, sort of how uh, we as a community of scholars uh, interested in Pakistan can also celebrate these kind of knowledge production, these kind of remarkable people, uh, the riverine activists that some of I have mentioned. And uh, I, I must just end with this like uh, note. I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to tell this story and uh, very grateful to the Pizada family for supporting scholarship in Pakistan. However, in Pakistan right now, we are facing extreme censorship and threats both to the activists and the scholar. And this is happening, uh, let me just point it out, because of the military and its control over Pakistan's political landscape. And so it's kind of like a sort of a very, um, uh, there's a sense of irony with which uh, I'm kind of speaking here very freely, very openly, something that is denied to me, an activist in Pakistan, and uh, in a prize that is named by someone, uh, Pirzada Sahab, who was, uh, as uh, Munis was introducing, uh, controversial to say the least. So uh, I'm gonna just uh, sort of stop here and uh, hope I can give you some ways of thinking about the river differently and hope we can discuss some of these things in the Q&A session. And uh, uh, I'll yield the stage to Isha, for which I have to turn off things. Let me do that. Thank you, uh, Esan. This was truly uh, provocative, as you intended talk, truly enriching. 
and full of just rich historical and ecological detail. I found it totally fascinating. And I also found your own dissertation, which I read in preparation for making these remarks, also very rich and fascinating, very nuanced. And this is something that I think we often miss in the uh, large river literature, as I said before. Uh, I'm also very respectful of and moved by the final comments you made which are about who enjoys you know, the freedom to speak and the freedom to be active and the courage of the activists on, in, in all three of these communities who are really um, putting, truly putting their bodies and their, their thoughts on the line in very, in very difficult circumstances. And I think you're pushing us to ask, well, what is our responsibility then when we study movements and we study rivers and we study nature and it's controversial to say the least in your language, do we as the academic community, the global academic community have a local responsibility to how we think about uh, these communities who who don't have the privileges that we have. I, I, I truly am very, I'm very moved by your ending uh, on that note because I think it is actually something that we, we lose track of, we don't think about often enough. And so I thank you for bringing that to our collective attention in addition to bringing your work to our collective, um, to our collective site. So I would like to, open my, to, to focus my comments on three framings. You gave us three provocations that were very important. And I think truly they were provocative, different ways of looking. So I just want to echo your provocations with three framings that struck me, not only as I heard you speak today, but when I was actually reading your work over the last week. Uh, and perhaps if you find time, you can just address how you see them and how your work contributes to that. So the first framing is something that you have pulled out over and over and referred to over and over in your work, which is the framing of commons and enclosures. And what was interesting to me is that, you know, traditionally the way we used to think about enclosures of whether it is of the land or whether it is of water, the enclosures always needed a kind of physical technology. Like fencing was what made land enclosures possible. These dams and barrages and the creation of these artificial lakes and reservoirs are what are making the river water enclosable, you know, uh, which is a modern technology. It was always very difficult to enclose water in the past. And now, of course, it's much more possible to do so. But I thought that your work pushed us a little further in our thinking about what is an enclosure of the commons beyond the technology of the dams that you showed in your slides. I thought that your work was also speaking to how you can enclose not just through steel and concrete, but you can also enclose through policy. You can also enclose through denial of rights, even if you don't actually have steel and concrete up there. You can also enclose by refusing to recognize, as you said, you used this expression in the last part of your talk, not allowed, right? What does it mean to say not allowed? You can enclose through refusing to recognize the damages, through refusing to recognize the community that is the community, right? And these forms, these recognitions, uh, these denials of what we might call recognitional justice are actually also forms of enclosure. And I wonder whether you have some thoughts to share with us and to enlighten us on what the relationship is between the steel and concrete enclosures, which occupy physical three-dimensional space and the more subtle enclosures of refusal of recognition or policy or denial of rights that are definitely aided and abetted by the steel and concrete, but actually have a life independent of the steel and concrete. And how do you see these two interacting in the creation of the enclosures that you have seen along the Sindhu Darya in your work? The second framing that fascinated me was it caused, your work caused me to think about the term belonging. Like what is belonging and who belongs to whom? 
And here I felt that you were separating a little bit or try, you, you know, explaining the difference to us between say a, a, a movement like Sanat, which is arguing, you know, how can you deny us this land belongs to us, this water belongs to us versus the SBT and not versus, but with a slight distance, a distinction with the SBT and the PFF. And personally in reading your work, I felt this very strongly in your discussion of the PFF, even more strongly than the SBT, but maybe that was just my interpretation of your work. That was not about the land and the river belonging to them. It was more like we belong to the river which is a very radically different kind of conceptualization. So in your dissertation, you wrote very fascinatingly the strategies, the ways in which these communities draw attention to their needs, draw attention to their rights, try a kind of Polanyi-like double enclosure of pushing out the World Bank and the state by speaking only in Sereki, for example, to say, you know, we also have means of excluding you. They may be small means, but we are not mean less, you know, we can also play this game at our level in our own way, which I thought was so interesting and fascinating. But I would love to hear more on not just how these communities express themselves in terms of loss and livelihoods, how they see themselves in relation to rights and the water and to, the, to how they see themselves in relation to the river, but what makes, not just how, but why some communities feel that the river and the land belongs to them, our law, our kanun, not yours, right? Versus we belong to the river, which is just such a, a, a different, and a, to me, it was a very profoundly moving distinction of who came first? Did we and our rights come first? Or did the river and its rights come first? How do you see that distinction, that deep distinction playing out amongst these communities, not just in terms of the strategies they deploy, but kind of where they come from is really what I'm speaking to. And the third uh, frame that I thought was so interesting in your work was your discussion of the role of the state. And I was thinking about the way in which the state comes through in your work is the state which has power, the state that is negotiating and sitting across from the World Bank. It is the big state or what we might call the regulatory state making policy and sanctioning enclosure, the post-colonial state. And then, you know, in every country and definitely in India and Pakistan throughout South Asia, there is the everyday state, the kind of street level bureaucrat run state, right? The people that the farmers and fishers usually see, rarely do they come across the guy who is sitting across them at the World Bank, sitting across the World Bank. The poor do they see? They see like the canal inspectors who has showed up to make sure that you have shut off your valve on time, right? They see like the police, you know, they see the local tax collector, they see, you know, what you can call the small arm of the everyday state. They don't really come into contact usually with the big arm of the grand state. And David Moss has written when he writes about water in South Asia, that policies are always actually getting made above, but they're actually getting remade on the ground because people, that is your three communities in this case, people are not actually malleable and uncomplicated subjects who are carrying out the word of the law. That's just not how people act. And similarly, Moss argues, and this is coming from a strong, long literature of street level bureaucrats, that the arm of the state on the ground is not necessarily behaving exactly the same way as the arm of the state you know, in parliament. Sometimes they're very oppressive, Sometimes they're secretly sympathetic to the communities and actually are more close to the communities in feeling than they are to their paymasters. Did you see this in the struggles of the Sindhu River? And if you did see any kind of uh, rupture between the big arm of the regulatory state and the everyday arm of what we can call the little state, the on the ground state, how did these tensions play out? And what difference did it make to, um, to the ability of communities 
to resist and really demand not only water, Ehsan, I felt they were demanding not only water, but they were demanding recognition. So those are my three comments for you. And um, please speak to whichever of them you feel most, uh, most comfortable speaking to. Thank you very much again for your fantastic talk. Uh, thank you, Ishana. Um, so, so really great provocations as well from your side. And uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to sort of head on answer these questions or, but I just to, to thinking about engaging with them. Uh, in my sort of reading of the idea, you're very right to point out that the enclosure of the commons, for instance, were as much a battle of fencing as well as uh, legal predations in the courts. And, you know, like, uh, the landlords would put fences and the uh, people will come and break them as well as fight these struggles in the court. And so there's some sort of a parallel here going on as well. But I think there's something about the materiality of the river itself and the nature of the enclosure, which has to be spread over large areas with these really billion dollars, as I've mentioned, like largest constructions humans have ever built. And so I think the physicality and the materiality is in some ways more pronounced. But you're very right to say that this is not just the physicality and materiality. It's also uh, policies, for instance, as I sort of mentioned and showed in the slides, the uh, Fisher Folk Forum, as well as Sindhu Vichawadwala have fought against the contract fishing regime, which is just basically a policy of how, who can fish uh, in these areas. And these, in, in a way, I think, if you have a strong state now in this day and age, in all likelihood, and this is kind of like the whole idea of the failed state notion, private property regimes will be enforced whether you build a fence or not. Like, I mean, that's pr primarily uh, what the state power is. And one can sort of take that as an indication. But to enforce like enclosures of rivers of this kind, uh, even these contract regime around barrages, uh, the infrastructures are really important. They, the barrages fragment the flow of the fish and the fishers. They kind of like tie the, uh, the fishers who were free to roam around in these fragments, particularly around the barrage. Uh, so so, so the, there is more of a physicality to these kind of enclosure. And I mean, generally, I think the theory of enclosure has expanded uh, tremendously from enclosure of the land. So, you know, we have I, uh, people talking about intellectual property, genes, GMOs, and so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of that going on, but there seems to be a tendency that, you know, we have these land enclosures where there was physicality, and now we have more of these uh, policy-based enclosures, which is very true and it applies in the rivers, but I still think that the nature of the enclosure the, 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 of the river, it has a longer history and the physicality is really a very important and pronounced part. Mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of belonging, I think uh, you're spot on. I, 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 this is like a small snippet. I mean, uh, I, I would argue that both PFF and Sindhu Vichawatarla have this discourse of, you know, it's not that we own the river, but we belong to the river. We are the heirs of the river. And of course, there is a lot of poetry and traditions where the concept of we, we are living in the land of the river. It's like, this is not something uh, that we don't know. It's actually the same thing about modernization that urban communities and particularly, let's say in Punjab, a lot of even my students, um, when they talk about river, they talk about the same thing, as you mentioned, like India-Pakistan water conflict and the distribution of waters. But these communities are living there. They have existential relationship to the river. And they understand that the power of the river. And, and, you know, there's rituals and ceremonies. When they're crossing the river, they throw money. And there is lots of, there's a whole world that's hidden. And it's precisely hidden because of the state desire to own the river. So you create that sort of physical infrastructure and the discursive uh, mechanisms as we know to control the river and it's very important to tell uh, people that yeah we need dams the water is going and wasting into the ocean well you know that's just ridiculous scientifically ridiculous so what uh, centering the figures of the fishers in the river uh, in these river defense movement is, is a critical part of this kind of like idea of river defense because there's an intuitive existential relationship it's their right the river is a life for them. like these, some of these fishers have lived their entire lives on the boats. I, I wish I'd shown some pictures of these uh, indigenous people and they're just dis disappearing because of the uh, enclosure effects. And the uh, role of the state. So, so I would be very, very honest, like the very brief response here is that the, I, I did not focus at all on the Abhijit state. And this wasn't like, a, 
Uh, I mean, you know, when I was going in the field and having some familiarity with everyday state literature, I was just kind of like interesting. And when you go and talk to activists in, let's say, Sindhu Gujaratullah, Fisher Folk Forum, you know, you hear stories about how uh, they're involved in local conflicts where it's water distribution. And so they do talk about interacting with the state. What was remarkable for me, if, if I were to comment anything on that, is that these movements have really built a lot of power. So for instance, uh, PFF and Muhammad Ali Shah Saab is very recognized and they're often like low level officials, for instance, like district government officials that would even show their sympathy and support for what PFF is demanding. But then the, 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 the tension that you made, the rupture between the everyday and the big arm of the state, the big arm of the state by and large wins. I mean, you know, the, the DC at the local level can do a little this, little that, but at the end of the day, the mega project is going to go ahead because the World Bank wants it or the investors want it or the Pakistani state wants it and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like my only sort of comment on this, uh, uh, this point. Thank you. Uh, Munis, am I turning it back to you now? You certainly can if, if the two of you are done with the conversation. Um, thank you so much, um, Essen, and thank you so much, Isha, for your comments um, and, of course, your responses as well, Essen. Uh, there's so much, I think, that you have uh, forced us to think about. Um, certainly me, I'm a historian. I work on medieval India, and, you know, although there is a connection to Pakistan and, you know, uh, you know, thinking about the space of Karachi next to a big, uh, you know, river like the Indus, but of course, a kind of, you know, it the way in which, you know, there's, the Indus is in the background. I mean, you know, people live in Karachi and they never visit the Indus. They never go into the Delta, right? So I felt that I learned a lot from not just reading your dissertation, but also from the conversation today. So um, Essen, as you know, uh, we're going to just ask two of our committee members, uh, David Gilmartin and then Homera Iqtadar to ask you uh, perhaps a question, maybe you respond to them, and then uh, we'll go into an open Q&A session. So if I can invite David Gilmartin to ask his question of uh, Essen. Thank you, Munis, and uh, thank you, Essen, for a really um, very engaging talk. And, and I was particularly interested in the provocations that you threw out toward the end. And, and along those lines, I, I, what I would like to ask is, um, in thinking about that question, because you precisely raised the question as to you know, how do we think about this as simultaneously an issue that is of deep concern and in very culturally grounded ways to these communities and activists on the river, and yet also a question that's really of concern to us and that we ought to think about how, you know, what our relationship is to this. So I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, one saw in all of your cases a, you know, some engagement in all of these groups that was on the one hand deeply tied to, if, if it's the right term, local culture, that was deeply tied to uh, linguistic and literary backdrops and to everyday engagement with the river. And yet at the same time also all of these groups are well aware of the international implications of what they're doing. So you called our attention to, you know, the very language on that um, uh, uh, Fisher folk um, poster, where on the one hand, it's the Sindhu Darya, and on the other hand, it's the Indus Delta simply transliterated, um, which suggests this engagement with the kind of scientific vision, international vision, even as there's a kind of rejection of that as well, that that's not all encompassing. Um, and, and one saw this also in the, the, the quote you, the, the um, part of the speech you played about the, the, um, the, uh, the Chashma Barrage protests. Um, so I, I'm wondering, so what is your take on this? 
I, I mean, you throw out this provocation, but what is, your, what is your take on the importance to these groups in how they see what they're doing of appealing to different audiences at the same time, to, to trying to couch their protests in language which can gain them allies on an international scale, and yet at the same time that can mobilize um, uh, local people, because this is something you alluded to, but in terms of sort of concrete thinking about what would they say about what, you know, we ought to be doing in relation to this. So I think you're muted. Yes, I have a habit of doing that in my lectures as well. And then after five minutes of long spiel, my students just like that, like, whoa, 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 you're muted. Um, so, so thank you, David. Thank you uh, for this question. So, so I'll say maybe a couple of things. First is that we know that there's a lot of critique, uh, uh, particularly around, and, and your work, fascinating work around the science of imperialism, imperial sciences. So there's this kind of like uh, uh, long-standing idea of the, the power of science in colonization itself, right? And engineering projects are very much a representation of that. But we've always kind of also known that science is not just that. Science is not just a, a desire to tame nature. It's like the particular interpretation, particular state and uh, catalyst projects of uh, controlling and taming nature. And this is more so, as I mentioned, this is these are 21st century movements. And the 21st century movements are like, you know, there's no sort of large conflict between these traditional ways of being with the river and the scientific knowledge around this that you know that riverine ecosystems must be protected so if there's a rupture i think it's like the the science and empire thing is in my view now ruptured and of course um, the 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 climate change movement is like perhaps the most recognizable example of that and in that sense the uh, the communities i mean you know there's no sort of like a, a romanticized version of this where these communities are just fishers who don't know about what's going on in the world, they are very much in conversations, as you mentioned, in dialogue with the happenings across the globe. Uh, and they've, they've formed allies, alliances with, uh, you know, Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum is part of the uh, uh, World Fisher Folk uh, Forum, I believe. I might be uh, saying that wrong, but basically, so there's a lot of exposure to global movements everywhere in the global south, including scientific environmentalism, so much so that whenever this activism is happening, so I go to Tonsa Biraj, I sit with Hadim, who has just grown all his life in front of the river, and he just in like 30 minutes explains to me these very detailed technical design complications of the remodeling of the Tonsa Biraj in like the most eloquent way that I would not probably get in a seminar because he is not only uh, reading and uh, work that is translated by other activists, urban activists, maybe more, uh, you know, uh, able to comprehend the scientific discourse and the technical discourse. He's able to take that, receive that, and then also he's witnessing those changes happening in front of him. So there's like that fusion that you're talking about is just all, all, very much presence all across. Uh, and same goes with the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum. So for instance, if these activists are looking for allies, one of their biggest ally would be some science, scientists who can do, uh, you know, a hydrological study or something that can support them. And they do that uh, uh, in, in these movements of river, as well as in other projects. For instance, some of these activists are fighting, and I'm participating in that, fighting against coal mining in Thar. And so, you know, a lot of reports are around hydrological impacts, public health impacts, and so on and so forth. Um, I feel I had something else to say, but I'm, I'm just blanking out on that. So I don't know if that's sufficient. No, Thank that's you. great. Thank you. Homera, perhaps I can ask you to join the conversation. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Essen, uh, for a fantastic talk and also for a really, really powerful dissertation. Um, you know, I can't really say it was a pleasure to read because in fact, there were parts of it that were really uncomfortable, uh, but I think that is part of the purpose, right? That is what you want your readers to feel. Um, and there is a lot of hope as well, which is um, uh, just from the successes of and the ideas that these movements have made available. 
So I wanted to pick up on one aspect of what you talked about today as well. And it's really an invitation for, um, exp for expanding on your ideas. And you mentioned, uh, I think, especially when you were talking about the Sats, you mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, there's a decoloniality. Uh, this is a decolonial approach in some ways. And I wanted uh, to provide this opportunity for you to expand on what you mean by that. Uh, one of the frustrations of uh, uh, political theory and history of political thought, uh, much of the writing on decolonial thought more recently, uh, and actually for some time, is that it is really focused on the question of representation. Um, and what I really appreciated in your dissertation is the bringing in of the political economy of actual lived experiences to do with resources, access to resources, livelihoods, uh, that is actually central to people's experiences of, you know, colonial modes of thinking and operating. Now, as Isha said, uh, the especially the two, the later two movements that you engage with, they actually really sidestep the question of representation in a sense that they actually invert that sense of belonging, right? So it's no longer about um, us and us being represented. It's almost as if they want the river to be represented. They want, and in fact, it's not even about representation, really. They want the river uh, to be understood. So I wanted to be, um, I guess I just wanted to uh, ask you to, highlight the key features of this decolonial uh, of decolonial thought and practice right what is it there is a spiritual cosmology here which goes beyond the secular religious divide often taken to be a constitutive feature of decolonial thinking um, you uh, there, it, there is, it is about resistance but all forms of resistance are not decolonial so what is it specifically about these movements that makes them decolonial as well um, at the same time as being resistance to particular modes of you know capitalist playing out in the global south thank you Mera. um so first of all, the question of representation is very important for some of these activists that are thinking about how to uh, go about organize. And I mean, the whole idea, as I showed in this slide video as well, with uh, Fazal speaking about the Sat, uh, you know, the idea is you got to reclaim that self-sovereign right to speak and to represent themselves. And uh, there are different models here. Uh, uh, so there's a sort of, you know, like within Pakistani social movements, there's a lot of discussion about uh, urban sort of activists sometimes representing rural movements in particular ways. Obviously, the whole literature on decolonization, particularly in South Asia, with subaltern politics kind of like really hones in on that. And I sort of think that the difference here um, from what you would say, this is narrow focus on representation and this what, what I'm sort of saying to bring in the material aspect, the political economy, the political ecology aspect as well. Uh, the difference really is that these, some of these activists were intellectuals and academics in their own right, uh, not just in these movements, but also in academic circles uh, in Pakistan. Um, they are aware of all this literature. So, you know, when the Sats are being organized in early 2000s, they have read and engaged with Marx and the subaltern studies collective and they've kind of like have ideas around what is good about this and how can we sort of take something good from this but then you know when it's it's center on the praxis of decolonization itself so how do you form institutions rather than just uh, uh, you know the kind of puzzle that a lot of people get into reading Spivak can the subaltern speak well the subaltern is organizing these forums it needs so, so I, I like the later framing that uh, Spivak has around subalternity as a condition of lack of institutional agency. So basically the subaltern speaks, but cannot be heard on the registers that are the institutional state arena. So the idea here is that how do you inculcate a praxis where you create spaces for subaltern seats? And when you do it next to the riverbank, how can it not be material? How can, so perhaps when we're sitting far in our, uh, academic seminar rooms, it's like, yeah, you know, but you're sitting right next to the river. You've seen the road kohi, you've seen the floods coming, you've seen the disintegration of the delta. And, you know, the, the 
difficult parts, the uncomfortable parts of the dissertation. Personally, I witnessed a lot of violence in Pakistan, but the destruction, ecological violence in the Delta was just like devastating. So there was an attempt to sort of tra transfer that sort of emotional uh, damage. So, so coming back to that, I think the, the idea of praxis is really important here. So, you know, the division between theory and academic investigation versus the material struggles of the people. And I, I think a lot of the literature coming out of uh, 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 Latin America, even parts of other parts of the world around uh, the, you know, the third sort of post-constructivist realm or the uh, this realm of the uh, polit uh, in political ecology, anthropology kind of touches on that as well. But for me, the idea here is that once you have uh, the institutions of self-representation and people will come and speak and these institutions are also performative, they're embodied, they're next to the river, they're walking the river, the materiality is just there. It's, it's present and it then shines through in the stories of these people. Thank you. Thank you, Homera. Um, as I said, we'll turn to some of the questions now. Um, what I'll try and do is maybe ask you a couple of broad questions, just feeding off the Q&A, and then perhaps um, get to some of the more specific questions. So one of the questions has to do with um, the other tributaries of the River Indus, you know, the Ravi, the Chenab, and the Sutlej, which, you know, you suggested have are much further along in terms of the kind of degradation that uh, is faced elsewhere. And so the question is, you know, how have communities that have, that are in a sense decades ahead in this process in terms of being impacted, dispossessed, dislocated, you know, um, how have they responded uh, as their lives have gotten tougher? Have they reached out to communities that are under threat right now? So what's the relationship between, in a sense, uh, threatened communities today and those that have in some ways been um, demolished, destroyed? Uh, are there connections? Are there links? Are there lessons that threatened communities today are learning from what has in fact transpired just a few decades before? Um, so, you know, just a question about linkages there. Should I go ahead or are you gonna Yes, ask please a... go ahead. No, I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Just respond as, okay. as I ask the questions, then I'll go into the main Q&A. Great. Uh, the very short answer is, to be honest, is I haven't really looked at that. In, in a way, I've kind of thought about it. Um, so, so there's definitely connection. So when you talk about the indigenous fishers, they also exist in other parts uh, of the country and other rivers as well. Um, but, uh, just the geography of it is that, you know, the rivers of uh, Punjab uh, are damned and diverted to such an extent that, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same sort of degree of presence of many of these communities. And so th they're very far advanced as, as, as you're saying, both in terms of the physical sort of displacement or distancing from uh, rivers, but also in terms of how, what it does to the political culture of these regions. So like, you know, the Punjab we know is the center of the, was one of the centers of the British empire in the sense of the investments, both in canal irrigation schemes and we know large scale deforestation that is happening at that time. And from the case of Tarbela, it's also obvious to me that once you have this large shock and the riverine communities are by and large displaced, then when new infrastructure, new projects, and new ideas emerge in the 21st century, then it's all, it's already very difficult to mobilize uh, around around these things. But to be very honest, I I kind of um, haven't looked at the other tributaries to say something more than what I've just said. Thank you. So, in terms of the various movements that you have studied, including the Sindhu Bachao Karla and across the PFF, what are the linkages between these movements? Um, do are they are they on the same page uh, most of the time, some of the time, never? Yes, uh, yes, they are, they are. They are on the same page uh, most of the time. Uh, so Sindhu Bajal Tarla, as I mentioned, uh, all three of these movements were part of these river-wide alliances uh, and were attending each other's events and were participating in the seminars. Uh, some of it what I refer to uh, in the dissertation in some detail. So there's a lot of collaboration. PFF 
expands out of the province of Sindh and has units in other parts. So it at some point formed a unit in uh, the around the Tonsa Biraj area with the some of the Sindhu Vichaltarla uh, members participating in that. And of course, there are some sort of tensions that emerge. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that tensions that also emerge, but there is a lot of sort of a broader. Uh, alliance on the sense of this Sindhi Saraiki kind of uh, linkages as well. You know, there are historical linkages between these communities. Uh, pretty much everyone I've met in Sindh can understand and speak Saraiki pretty well. And the conversation when these activists come together happens in these, you know, they'll speak in Saraiki, we'll respond in Sindhi. So it's very multilingual. So there are these deep connections, and so much so that, as I was mentioning, that, you know, there. In the early 2000s, there's a lot of scene and collaboration, but even around other issues, for instance, as I mentioned, uh, Sindhu Vijal Tarla, not the uh, organization, but a lot of activists activists from the Saraiki region that are also part of the Sindhu Vijal Tarla in some sense, are at the time working with the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum against uh, Thar Kol mining fields. So there is a lot of collaboration and cooperation that's happening. And with every kind of alliance and collaboration, there is some tension, difference of opinions that need to be flushed out and, you know, so... So it's pretty much there. So as in a lot of the literature on Pakistan, at least till fairly recently, was about Pakistan as a failed state and how, you know, this big kind of question going, you know, what keeps Pakistan together, so to speak? And, you know, where do we see uh, the strength of the state? So in the context of a failed state kind of conversation, um, where would you place your story? Um, is this a failed state or is this actually uh, anything but a failed state? <laughs> and I'm, so kind yeah, of building, I'm kind of building on, on Isha's comments about the regulatory arm of the state versus the little state. So um, maybe you can just say something about that. I'll say very briefly in the sense that, of course, Pakistan, literature on Pakistan has thought about the idea of failed or weak states and the idea of the overdeveloped states. So whether the state is failing because it's weak or because it's really, really overdeveloped is, and you know, in Pakistan, there's a lot of evidence. And I think in a way, as I mentioned that there are state failures, but what I classify as state failures is its own sort of claims of controlling the entire Indus water and rivers, just as met with these ecological material failures and then resistance to that, that threatens the legitimacy of the state itself. So there is failure in that sort of sense, but it's not because of weak institutions or these theories about, you know, that. Uh, uh, there's some elements to that as well, but it's primarily because the state, in a way, is imposed on a geography, uh, the, the thing that gives somewhat coherence to uh, the territory of Pakistan, not all of it, but the, is the, 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 the legacy, the memory of the Indus Valley civilization and the culture around these rivers. And as I mentioned, these Saraikis and the sort of linguistic uh, uh, similarities and with other parts of uh, Pakistan as well. So the imposition of that sort of a strong overdeveloped state leads to these kind of failures. Uh, and, you know, of course, more democracy, more representation, self-representation, uh, the more space that is created for that, I think the state failure, uh, we can sort of like move towards a better functioning state, if I may. Yeah, although you seemed a little pessimistic in terms of movement toward that kind of a greater space uh, at this point in time. so. Would you say that in fact spaces are shutting down um, for people, you know, who are fighting the good fight, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the degree of violence and repression has definitely gone up, but there are spaces, there are uh, ways of uh, doing that. And because again, as I'm saying that the model of engagement here is quite intuitive. It's kind of like allowing people to come forward and talk about their grievances. So the model of Sat, for instance, or the caravans, for instance. And in the current scenario, uh, the similar sort of people's tribunal processes, the PFF is organizing in uh, in other parts of the Sin in Tarkol with the name of Rajoni Kart, they're slightly different. But, you know, there were, there were concerns about uh, repression from uh, uh, the, the strong arm of the state. But the thing is that it, while repression has gone up, there is still sort of space to sort of operate and do some sort of activism and have positive outcomes for peoples and communities as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, before I turn to the questions, Essen, you know, I, as you know, I, I grew up in Karachi and 
it's amazing. In my 17 years of growing up in Karachi, I actually only visited the Indus once. Um, you know, and therefore there's, there's such a kind of disconnect uh, in some ways. And maybe my experience is just, you know, atypical. Most people do spend, you know, weeks and weeks traveling up and down the Indus, I suspect not. Uh, but, uh, you know, my completely and utterly disconnected experience, you know, the Indus was there, the Delta was there to the East. Somehow we learned more about Junagar and about the run of Kutch and the 65 war than we did about uh, something like the Indus, you know, I mean, and that is just so striking. And I, and I, you know, I, it, I hope it's not just the story of someone who was growing up in the eighties uh, like me, but, you know, um, well, I hope it is the story of just someone growing up in the eighties and it's very changed today. But of course this does raise the question of, you know, how a, how do you educate a megalopolis that depends so heavily on water being transported to it? And a megalopolis that we know is drying out as well, right? Where there's ever more desperation about water. So when we think about political alliances and we think about connections, social and otherwise, how does one, you know, how, if you could put on a cap and just kind of speculate with us for a second, how would you, how would you bring these two arenas into conversation with one another? Or is it impossible because of, you know, uh, different physical contexts, different ethnic uh, outlooks, you know, relationships of urban versus rural, uh, Sindhi versus, you know, what have you, uh, Mohajir dominated Karachi. I mean, how does one bring this conversation together? The, the challenge is definitely immense. As you're right, like uh, most people in Pakistan do not have, uh, as I would call it, this river experience or river thinking. Uh, and yeah, like for Karachi, in this, people may not even know, but in this is the water supply, right? So it's like most of Karachi's water comes from the Indus River. And uh, so there's conflicts of interest that are happening. And even in some of these spaces where uh, uh, Loksat is organized or Karavan is organized, there are tensions between people who dream of canal irrigation and the wealth that that brings and those who are sort of arguing for traditional ways. And for a lot of people, it's just hard to imagine how this will shift. But I, I would just say that, look, this is like a, this is not a small project. This is like a 150 year old project to enclose the river. And we are facing the consequences of that. So it's it's not gonna go away. The, the good thing is that you can find ways to talk about the river. Like if 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 PFF and like you know the, the Saraiki poetry is laced with this idiom, not only just Ashulal but many Rifat Abbas, many other Saraiki poets talk about the river, and I, I think that it's just that the idea of these movements and for me personally to uh, to to as serve as a conduit for their stories is partly to just promote this idea of the river. And yes, then you come into policy questions, and then you can set with. Muhammad Ali Shahzab or Mustag and they'll tell you, right? Like, you know, that, yeah, you can sort of, uh, the, 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 you can talk about the river and still not just talk about it in a romanticized way where you're not addressing the concerns of water scarcity. You can sort of give a great analysis of how water management practices can be transformed uh, slowly, gradually, perhaps through different op re-optimization of dam flows and environmental flows. and but you know, it's like literally going back to what I said, and this is river is a land problem for the state. And so making river and thinking river as a river is literally the first step in having sort of that conversation. Most of the conversations in Pakistan, as Isha was also saying, is around water, like the category of water, which is already an abstraction that is happening. Right, no, thank you for that. Okay, so um, Asan, we're gonna to turn to the audience Q&A and I'm just gonna say this to the audience out there. I'm not taking your questions in the order that they were received, but rather I'm just kind of gonna bounce all over the place uh, and you know, kind of uh, exercise my judgment in terms of just questions that I would like Asan to answer. So the first question actually is the most recent one from Sarah Zevi, who asks you um, to discuss the role of women in these movements. Um, they seemed present, you could hear their voices, um, what, but you know, what's their role in these um, organizations and to what extent would, and I would just add this, do women's voices add a certain a different set of nuances to um, what's unfolding on the ground? Have these movements, for example, empowered 
certain kinds of women's voices, um, you know, offered them a certain kind of, um, you know, ability to mobilize and be heard that they may otherwise have found hard to, you know, achieve. Well, uh, thanks to Sarah. Sarah is one of my great teachers and a good friend. So it's wonderful to have her sort of challenge me with that sort of like her preciseness and sharpness. Um, the, 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 this is a, so the women are very much, for instance, in PFF, the women are very much part of the movement. Uh, you saw that in the marches as well. And the PFF is very much aware of the fact that, you know, this is a sort of a total devastation and requires a total response. So, you know, it can't be just men. And there's a lot of activism that is done and very strategic thinking around how do you go and organize in areas where women generally, uh, you know, face restrictions on mobility and uh, are not allowed to be in, this, in, 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 in the uh, public space. And now, you, you know, bring them out and uh, sort of, uh, you can see women now protesting and dancing in these protests as well. And this has been going on for two decades. This the same thing is happening in the Saraiki uh, region as well. So the women are present, but I will say this, that, there, there is definitely, definitely a lot of room for improvement there. And I will also say in terms of my own investigation, while I was able to conduct interviews with some women, but primarily I'm a man going and hanging out with other men and, you know, doing this research. And in a way that is somewhat reflective of a lot of political activism that is happening in the circle. Women, are, as I said, definitely present and very visible. But there are tensions, and I would say that this is a huge gap in my research, and this can be uh, an opportunity for some, because we need like women to, who can sort of hang out with women to do this kind of research. This is like sort of uh, a limitation, a big limitation of this particular study. And so. Thank you for that, uh, Essen. So uh, Aisha Vamuri, kind of, you know, picking up on that, the earlier question by Sarah Zedi, um, she had a couple of questions. Let me begin with the one that actually has to do with clay matkas. What was the significance of the breaking of the matkas that you showed in one of the videos? Right. So, so symbolically, basically, women, uh, and, and this is where the representation comes through, uh, women are the primary, uh, primarily responsible for bringing, uh, you know, water uh, for the household. So, you know, men are going and doing other things and women have to go. And the more scale, water scarcity uh, you uh, sort of see, then the, the, the more difficult it is and harder it is for women to get that. So that's sort of like a symbolic sort of uh, gesture of uh, defiance, both in the sense of, you know, this is not just women's task, but also in the kind of way of, you know, there's no, no water left for us to go and fetch. Like, what do we do with this matkas? And I think there are some other sort of spiritual significance around the matka and the river, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, which requires more work, but for particularly for my understanding of talking with the people there, uh, this is to both center the idea that uh, the lack of water is really, really deeply affecting women in ways that uh, is, is sort of often overlooked in these debates about water distribution and profit and irrigation and economic growth. And then this, this idea of this women kind of like, there's no water what do we do with this matkas? Right. Um, so continuing with Aisha Vamuri's um, line of questioning, I have another question for you, which has to do with uh, alliances, um, cross-border solidarities, other kinds of political alliances between the communities that you're looking at and communities that are facing many of the same issues across, say, northern and central India, but also beyond. Uh, in, across South Asia. Are they in conversation with one another? Do you know if, you know, they, there are contacts between groups across South Asia or not? Well, I definitely, uh, the, when I classify that turn of the century sort of movement uh, in, in that earlier period, we have some sort of uh, uh, alliances. There's like uh, the South Asian network for river dams and people and some of the riverine activists in Pakistan were participant in that. And there's definitely a deep study of the movements like Narmada Bachao Andolan. And, you know, it's hard to have these kind of exchanges in India and Pakistan. Excuse me. We're well aware of that. But there were opportunities. For instance, uh, PFF was the co-organizer of the World Social Forum in Karachi in 2006. And so, you know, you can see like pictures of Indian 
uh, activists uh, like Arun, even Arundhati Roy visiting the BFF of Brian Hadri area. So there is some conversation, but you know, this is the problem with India and Pakistan. There's so much we can do if we kind of are able to get together and do something, but that's just like, you, we all know what that's about. Right. So Anand Patel asked us one of the first questions. He basically asked a simple question. Can dams and other solutions coexist with one another or is it a zero sum game? I think the transition from what we are now, where we are now, to what the world will look when we are able to figure out how rivers can flow freely again and we can sort of coexist, dams will continue to kind of like have a role. This is my idea. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, calls for uh, decommissioning dams, but I don't think it's happening at the pace where the scientific evidence kind of demands, like not only just for human communities, but non-human human communities as well. There are, alternative, there are many alternative to dams. Like first and foremost is just re-optimizing the functioning of the dam. So you have to, if you look at the chart of the Indus flows, then you can see sort of like in some months, you know, the flow goes up and goes down and then, and the fish migration patterns sense those river flows and depend on those river flows. And so right now it's kind of almost like a flat line. So it needs to go closer to that. And this can be done by increasing uh, environmental flows, but overall, whatever a big, large dam can do, I think there are cost-effective alternatives for doing that. And this has to shift. This has to go. We have to transition out of this age of mega dams. Right. So just speaking of the age of mega dams and what's coming in the future, I mean, we know that the Himalayas are beginning to slowly melt. We know that over the next 100 years, profound uh, effects are going to be felt across the Indian subcontinent. I think Pakistan in that a certain kind of desiccation effect, uh, increased heat, um, massive water runoffs. Um, and of course, that's one of the arguments that we have to find a way to you know, keep the water. Uh, if we allow it to run off, there may not be any water the following year if the snowfalls fail and things like that. How do you respond to that kind of you know, um, future environmental concern question? I mean, it's really simple. Like if you look at some of the very ambitious plans of the uh, water bureaucracy, Wagra in Pakistan, they're, they're planning to build cascades of dam from the mountains, like literally one dam uh, and the reservoir uh, uh, leading into the reservoir of the next dam to the next dam with this kind of logic. And the thing that's gonna happen, I mean, uh, this is not a speculation, like it, with the fast rate of uh, glaciers melting, we're gonna have extreme flood events. All of these dams are built on these archaic ideas of 100 year floods and 1000 year floods, which are gonna just disappear. What are alternatives to storing water? I mean, we seriously need to think about rejuvenating the groundwater. And I think once you look at Pakistan's irrigation system, you see almost 40% of the irrigation water is kind of lost. I'm, I might be off uh, by a few percentages, but that amounts to like eight or 10 dams. Like, so, so in a way we can find efficient, effective ways moving away. And that's where we need to go. We won't be able to store dams for what, like for one season or two seasons, what's the game plan here? How do you store water when the water sources are depleting? You have to shift to a water conservative strategy. Pakistan is the biggest exporter of groundwater and this, this just is unsustainable for where we're heading. But it sounds like that's not happening. I mean, in fact, we're doubling down on the damming strategy, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. And, uh, but, but I, I think that uh, right now, Pakistan is building a Bhasha Dam. Um, and uh, that's, you know, we can sort of maybe talk this conversation for another day. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's like a long history of Pakistan preventing the construction of big dam. Kalabak Dam, as many of you know, is not, is, was on the cards even before Tarvela Dam was built. And, you know, it wasn't, we, that didn't get built. And so, you know, there is the possibility of preventing these kind of big projects as well. Right, right. So Shahid uh, Shah, uh, you know, has a question about uh, the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, which is demanding and he quotes it, personhood rights for the Indus River and the Indus Delta. And he looks at the role of the state in Pakistan where even human beings are not given basic rights. So how do you, and where do you see that demand uh, playing out? 
I mean, the, the answer is in the question. Shahid Saab, Shahid Saab is uh, with PFF and uh, a wonderful person. Shout out to him and PFF. Um, the, the, the personal right campaign was started when I was luckily actually in the field. and I was uh, able to travel with the uh, uh, PFF activists and communities and able to sort of witness how this idea of personal rights, which a lot of people just really raise eyebrows and don't really comprehend how someone would communicate, like for instance, how Shasa will communicate this to a community at uh, far, far, like 200, 300 mi uh, kilometers away from the river in the, in the uh, desert. And the, the answer is fairly simple. The Fisher Folk Forum and its communities, they understand what personal rights mean. Like they understand what rights for themselves mean. They fought for them. They've gotten many of them and they've realized the power that they have. And they also then understand the personal rights of river. River is a living entity that needs certain kind of flow patterns. And so they understand that the personal rights of live river mean a healthy system. Now, the question where uh, Shai Chasa is posing uh, uh, when humans are not getting rights, so how can rivers get rights? I, I don't think that's this is a either or. It's actually for the fisher folk community. And that's the strength of this movement as well. That it's linked to the rights of the fishers, it's linked to the life, rights of the people as well. Great. Um, kind of following on that, uh, Hira Nabi asks, what kinds of rights can a river expect to obtain now? We are in a time where forests and trees and glaciers are being animated in legal spaces and activist circles. Can the right to survive be invoked by a river? So, so we see in 2016, 17, uh, three major rivers in the world got rights, the Wanganui River in New Zealand, uh, the Atrato River in Colombia, and for a brief period, the Ganga uh, in uh, India. And this is certain sections of the rivers. And they, they, they're getting rights based on a very variety of different sort of uh, reasonings. One is for uh, claims of indigenous people, the spiritual significance in India, Ganga being a sort of a spiritual Hindu sort of deity. Uh, in Atrato, it's a mix of biodiversity concerns and indigenous people. And so, so there is stuff happening around the rights of rivers and the rights of rivers are the right for the river to flow as it would without human destruction. That's kind of like what it is. And as I said, that this idea is you, in the literature around rights of river or environmental rights, the idea is posed as you should frame it as rights of human beings to river in resources rather than right of that resource itself. Whereas the communities are repeatedly, as I said in the previous question uh, as well, that these are not decoupled things. Now, how would they, they get the rights? Uh, I think Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, in, for, for that matter, is a very sort of a interesting way of strategically making these moves, of introducing ideas and sensing what can be claimed. And so when the personal movement happened in 2018, like well, after a long march at Kotri, uh, uh, we wrote a sort of a press release as like, I mean, just, uh, BFF wrote a press release and they asked me to sort of translate it and I translated it. And the largest English daily in the next uh, the dawn uh, published an editorial calling for rights of rivers, or at least making a some, some sort of a claim for rights of rivers. So, you know, in terms of social movement gains and successes, that's kind of like a huge, uh, huge deal as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, particularly in the context of Pakistan, where indigeneity and environmentalism isn't that pronounced outside of these movements that I discuss. That takes us to our next question, actually. It's kind of building on, on that insight and that comment by you. Um, and this is from Mehvish Ahmed, who asks, you know, basically, how did the rights of the river discourse make its way to Pakistan? Is it an indigenous discourse? Is it an external discourse? Is it some, you know, uh, mishmash of the two? Can you give us some sense of, of its history uh, in Pakistan? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, just focusing on the Fisher Folk Forum, as I mentioned, that they're uh, from their inception in conversation with movements of Fisher people and uh, river people and anti dam movements across the globe. And so they're very uh, keenly observing what's going on. And the, uh, the New Zealand example, the Wanganui River in New Zealand is, uh, you know, was a significant thing for PFF to sort of maybe sense that, yeah, these are the rights that are being discussed all over the world. So in a small village in Puleli next to a small lake, 
these examples are given that this these rights and ideas are uh, going across all across the world. But you know this, this so so there is a lot of exchange that's happening. These movements are not isolated, but they're not also just taking ideas and from top down and you know just these ideas are coming and transforming everything. As I mentioned, that they have a lot of pop work, a lot of institutional building, a lot of conversation that are happening, and it's also because these concepts are intuitive, right? So the idea of a huck for an individual and huck for the river then kind of uh, makes intuitive sense to people. And that's why they talk about these things. Great. Um, Mem Shamat continues with another question and I'd like to just read it out to you. How did the experiences of organizing for the Loksat and the Long Marches build on older genealogies of river community relationships? Um, and also more specifically, although I think you've kind of talked about this, but maybe you can return to it, reconfigure social relationships, especially between men and women. Right, so, um, Munis, can you kind of maybe repeat the question? I've kind of lost. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. So I think the question was, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to um, scroll back over here. Um, I seem to have lost the question. Um, I think the question was basically, you know, thinking about genealogies um, and specifically thinking about uh, how certain, how these movements, uh, what sort of social relationships are involved in these movements? How do they affect uh, men and women? Um, you know, so on and so forth. Sorry, I, right. I actually lost my train of thought as well because the question vanished from my screen. Punida has very kindly put it in the chat. Ah, me, so thank you. <laughs> How did the experience of organizing for Lokset and the long marches uh, not just build on old genealogies of river community relationships, but also reconfigure social relationship, for example, between men and women? So, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the whole idea here is that uh, not only just the Lokset, but the PFF experiences I've mentioned, there is definitely an attempt, and uh, women themselves speak of this. So, women in the Basti Sheikha next to Don Sabiraj, when I would speak to them, they have this joyful, gleeful way of talking about, oh, we went to the World Bank and we the police was coming and we took out their batons and we just like hit them back with it. You know, there's like this kind of like thing that, oh, we are doing this thing. And I think it's just, uh, you're right that these spaces are not only just reviving some romanticized notion of the past, but are operating in the current moment. And uh, as I said, there is a lot more work that needs to be done and activists are doing it. Like Saraiki was saying, uh, in a recent event, they particularly focused on bringing women to that sort of event, uh, just because you know there's a, a broader wave like in Aurat March in Pakistan or the global feminist movements. It, these are all inter intersecting and in, uh, uh, transforming uh, this idea. So the Lok Sadhism and the Long Marches aren't just these old uh, revivalist movements, but they are transformative movements in this way. Right. Um, so I'm going to maybe uh, ask one more question over here. This is from Ayaz Qureshi. Um, and he talks about how a few years ago, religious extremists in central Punjab organized around water scarcity, uh, you know, especially in the vicinity of the River Ravi. And he was wondering if there are any chances of that happening with concerns around Indus water in the Sarai Kiva side. But also just kind of building on that question, uh, as and I was just wondering, you know, Tahir Kamran and other people have talked a lot about, uh, done a lot of very good work on the rise of religious extremism in central Punjab. And I was wondering if, you know, I mean, you know, people like uh, Professor Kamran and others talk about it primarily as a struggle between middle class uh, shopkeeper types and, and older communities of landholders. And I was wondering if there was any sort of layering that you could see uh, around water and water concerns. And again, you know, basically the drying up of central Punjab. In other words, the link between a certain kind of extremism and also, you know, what's happening environmentally, especially building on Ayaz's, uh, Ayaz Qureshi's question about a certain kind of advocacy for water rights in central Punjab by religious extremists. I would say this that uh, so first of all people who are part of the Sindhu which are Tarla, certainly not extremists but are religious and you know very sort of like grounded in uh, uh, not only just local spiritual traditions of religion interpretations of religion but also just whatever we may call as the orthodox religious space 
And so there is always a possibility of kind of like individuals with these kind of like strong religious sentiments to participate in these movements. But there is certainly uh, the extremist part, I feel uh, one has to sort of consider that certain practices around river for some extremists might be seen as uh, outside of the fold of Islam. So it does create a threat for these kind of uh, activists in some ways. And, um, and, and in some other ways, already existing religious conflicts like the targeting of minorities and uh, Ahmadis in particular has caused lives of some of these activists as well. So I, I don't know much more about whether uh, religious extremists organizing around water scarcity is going to resonate with this kind of river activism. I, I, I would have to look more into it, but I don't, I won't be surprised if that's tied up to this anti-India Kashmir Hamara kind of a narrative around water. So I don't know enough about this. In Saraiki Vasev, I, I didn't experience these kind of like uh, things, but we it was happening all around us in other ways like the Tehreek al Pakistan was in full flow during my field work and, you know, prevented me from traveling back to Islamabad for about a couple of a week or so in, in some ways as well. So there's like, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how to wrap my head around it, except that political groups, whether they're religious extremists or not, they tend to, Pakistan has a lot of politics, so they'll pick any issue and do it in this way. But I, I would like to read and see more, how are they framing that issue? Is it about the river? Is it about this India, Kashmir sort of narrative? Uh, so, so, yeah. I, yeah, I so much. it would be very interesting to know a little bit more about that. And I actually just said that, you know, in the context of um, lots of conversations to do with, you know, disaster relief and how disaster context, you know, whether it's earthquakes or other, you know, floods. And there's always, a, you know, a narrative, especially here in the United States about, you know, certain extremist organizations going in and, you know, capitalizing on the weakness of the Pakistani state and NGOs and, you know, what have you, mobilizing around these issues. So, I mean, just, I think it's kind of interesting. Can, to I, through can this. I add to that? Uh, just Please. maybe maybe something right from, like uh, almost a direct quote from one of the Saraiki uh, activists around this. And this goes back to your thing, question about the weak state. Like, I mean, when we were in Tonsa and uh, this uh, religious extremist group was organizing uh, protests and nationwide protests, the amount of resources that were invested in the banners and everything just does not make sense that this is just a space created that the uh, religious extremists are uh, occupying. I think there's like this active support and backing and we, I mean, I don't want to land anyone in trouble, including myself. So we kind of know who those uh, funders and backers are. So this goes back to the question of the strong state supporting and facilitating religious extremists. And for Saraiki, this uh, Sindhu Chaudhala, some, uh, some other activists, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of like maybe. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Asim. Thanks for your candor. Uh, and thank you for, you know, not just a wonderful presentation, but also for, um, you know, being just so articulate and, and uh, you know, explanatory and, and at the same time passionate about the work that you're doing in the Q&A. So now it just gives me uh, the pleasure to ask our, you know, the endower of the Pizada Prize, the Pizada, to just log on, say a few words to you and to the audience as well, and then I will just close things up. So, Rafat. Thank you, Monis. Uh, first of all, Essen, uh, congratulations. Uh, you're joining uh, some very, very notable people who hopefully will go on to be the rock stars in uh, Pakistani. Uh, to come up with new work on Pakistan. I'm so very pleased uh, to see how this prize has evolved. And uh, I'm really, really um, very thankful to you for giving a wonderful presentation. I'll again uh, piggyback on what Monis was saying that uh, not only are you a great scholar, but you're very, very articulate and also I found your candor very refreshing. There were times when uh, you didn't know the answer and you said that. And there were other times that uh, you said some very things that needed to be said. Um, 
to my father and I guess to me as well, controversy is not something new. So uh, one of the uh, unwritten aims of the Pirzada Prize was to create controversies. And I'm very happy to say that majority of the winners have created something new and somewhat controversial. Um, it, 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 we talked about it earlier, and I don't know if it was right at the beginning of the talk, uh, but when Isha was mentioning that uh, it's very interesting that two consecutive prizes have gone on water-related topics. And as I'd mentioned in the previous prize that water-related topics have a great significance on my father's career. Um, and in fact, in retrospect, I think I should have, uh, I could have done it differently. We talked about his foreign uh, uh, relationship, uh, his Ministry of Foreign Affairs work with this one because it's probably more relevant. But nevertheless, um, I talked about that last time, but I'll talk about something equally interesting that uh, back in the 60s, he uh, argued a case on water rights, the groundwater rights against the colonial laws. And uh, I think he won that case. And it so impressed the then Lord Chancellor of England, Lord Denning, who was the Chief Justice and head of the House of Lords, that uh, he um, started following my father's arguments. And then when the opportunity arose, he met him. And he was quite, in his colonial mentality, was quite surprised to find out that my father had never studied in England and didn't have a bar at law. So he rectified that, that a few years later, uh, my father got the uh, first uh, honorary bar at law in, of the 20th century in England. And uh, it was a unique um, achievement uh, for him. But uh, of course, he never took it too seriously because he'd already argued successfully in front of the International Court of Justice. So this was just one other thing he had. But it was interesting that how the uh, Lord Chancellor said, well, such a good lawyer should have English <laughs> training and at least have an English degree. So he did that. Um, I also would like to mention two personal things I saw in your uh, dissertation. One was about the uh, very important cabinet meeting uh, during Ayub Khan's regime that took place, I believe in April, 1967 that you mentioned. Uh, I'm pretty sure that my father as Minister of Foreign Affairs was, would have been in that meeting and uh, played a very important part in having these discussions about the Tarbela Dam, uh, because one of the jobs of the Minister of Foreign Affairs is to balance the conf often conflicting needs uh, between the donors, the, uh, what the state wants, and more importantly, the rights of the people. And I hope that uh, in this particular case, he deferred more towards the rights of the people. Um, it's, a, it, it's a very tricky balance and uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated uh, issue, but I'm glad that you at least mentioned that cabinet meeting taking place and some important decisions coming out of it. Um, and then you also alluded to uh, the case of Wabda in during, uh, with respect to the people of, uh, the rights of the people of Tarbela in 1975. And I recall that my father was managing that case and we visited Tarbela. And of course I was fairly young then. So my only memories of visiting Tarbela was the fantastic Italian food we had at the restaurant in uh, Tarbela. The, Tarbela was of course run by the Italians. Um, but getting back to all the people and uh, the work over here, I want to thank Monis and the judges. Uh, every year, the task of the judges becomes more difficult because there are some wonderful thesis uh, dissertations that come in and I don't know how they make these choices. They, when I look at, read some of them, it would be very, very difficult to pick one. I mean, uh, there's no, I, I don't want to uh, demean Essen's work in any way on this, but the fact is it's a very difficult task and they, they always seem to pick the best dissertation and do a wonderful job. And the unsung heroes in all of this, of course, is the staff of the South Asian Institute. They do so much work, so much enthusiasm, 
And uh, it's always been such a pleasure working with them. And I really appreciate that. And then finally, I'd like to thank the entire audience. Uh, this was probably in terms of the questions of the several we've had, uh, this is probably the most engaging. Some wonderful questions were asked. And I'm so glad to see that this is one of those things that Monis always used to emphasize that it's just not the presentations, but the discussions that happen that make this. And I'm so happy to see how all of this is panning out. And uh, again, uh, finally, again, I want to thank Monis because um, while I have done the easy work in providing the funding, the heavy lifting on how this prize evolves and how all the work that goes, Monis has done so much on it and deserves all the credit. And so thank you, all of you. Over to you, Monis. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Thank you for your generous comments. Um, and again, I want to thank you for endowing this prize. I want to congratulate uh, Essen on his achievements. And, you know, uh, again, Essen, really a wonderful dissertation and a really, you know, a thought provoking piece of work. And I really am looking forward to the day when you take this dissertation and you transform it into a book. And furthermore, you know, try and get someone to translate it into, uh, you know, Urdu or some of the other local languages. I think there is a huge gap between the kind of work we do here in the United States and the ecosystems that we create for this kind of work and just a disconnect. Most people don't have access to English uh, books and English materials. And so let me begin this year by encouraging you. I've not done this in the past, but I'm going to try and do this every year from now on forward. Find a way to translate this stuff for people in Pakistan into Urdu, and then you can start thinking about other languages. But I think it's really key that these conversations not be hived off in English um, and be more readily accessible to others. Thank you, global audience, for joining us today. Um, and if you want to know more about the Institute for South Asia Studies, um, you know, please just join our mailing list. Uh, you just go to the website. There is a join button at the top right hand side. And you'll get a lot of announcements about stuff that is of no interest to you, perhaps, but there will be hopefully lots of other um, you know, talks and engagements, conferences, other things that might be of interest to you and might take you, you know, across uh, the whole terrain of South Asia, not just Pakistan or, um, you know, India or Bangladesh, but everything as a whole. So on that note, please take care.